one time I remember uh, dri traveling in Tunisia and I'd fallen in with an English fellow, um, nice fellow with a estuary accent, middle class, um, almost a stereotypical kind of lower middle class Englishman. Uh, and I remember him sort of poking fun at himself once when we stopped at a bus stop and he noticed, as you notice everywhere in uh, bus stations or main squares of any Tunisian town or village, there's a large clump of men sitting around uh, in a kind of ramshackle looking open air cafe, uh, drinking endless cups of mint tea, perhaps smoking cigarettes and talking or perhaps just staring into space. <laughs> Um, relaxing. Dolce far niente, I guess you'd call that. Um, the um, interesting thing that he said was, he says, my English sensibilities are offended by the sight of all these people doing nothing. These men, you know, <laughs> men should be out working or whatever. And he, he didn't really say it as an actual way of making fun of the Tunisians or criticizing them. It's kind of that faulty towers type humor where it's an Englishman poking fun at his own Englishness. Sort of saying, look at what a bloody neurotic I am. Here I am in Tunisia and I see people relaxing and it offends my Englishness. <laughs> um, I don't think that that's as absurd as one might think, simply because I live in a society where industriousness is you know, valued at least overtly uh, as much as the English do. Canadians aren't terribly industrious, but, you know, they're, uh, you know, we have a work ethic and, you know, people should work, etc. And, you know, idle hands do the devil's work. And it's pu fairly puritanical. Canadians, even if they're liberal, uh, like arch-liberal, live a kind of a puritanical, restrained, hard-working life. Um, and I don't think that we'd, we're like this because it's a virtue. And I don't think the English are either. They say that, that, that patience, thrift, industriousness, all this kind of thing, diligence is a virtue. Maybe, but I tend to see it in a different light. And again, this is from, this rears its head all the time when I'm reading or going through Schopenhauer having, being read to me on, on YouTube. Um, boredom stands at the end of everything, boredom or suffering. You overcome a need or a desire and then you're bored. So you have to, another desire will take over. I think that any country with, um, or any culture with a strong sort of puritanical work ethic might tell itself that it's doing this as a virtue, but I think in many ways that kind of attitude is an expression of mortal dread at the evil monster that is boredom. Um, idle hands do the devil's work, etc. Watch how insane people go if they get bored. Um, you know, all the wars that Europe uh, had to endure up until the 20th century were usually just caused by aristocrats who felt like starting a war for something to do with their neighbor. Uh, weren't terribly worried about casualties because these people that were the casualties were there to die. If you got killed in battle, it's because you deliberately put yourself in harm's way. You could have stayed out of it. You'll fight a duel. You'll do just about anything to avoid being consumed by boredom. Um, I, I'm throwing around my new favorite word, acedia, which is a sort of a fascinating and nuanced term that um, you know, I've been toying with for a number of years. Um, it's well, I'll just read off the Wikipedia uh, definition. It's reasonably good. Um, acedia, from Latin acedia, uh, describes a state of listless, listlessness or torpor of not caring about, uh, or sorry, of not caring or not being concerned with one's position or condition in the world. It can lead to a state of being unable to perform one's duties in life. Its spiritual overtones make it related to, but argu arguably distinct from, depression. Acedia was originally noted as a problem among monks and other ascetics who maintained a solitary life, and a lot of the means that I've found to explore it is through the um, works of the, the monastic communities in medieval Europe, and, and early medieval Europe, and how to deal with it. Because Acedia isn't just boredom, it's boredom and depression and 
a state of being checkmated and perhaps stricken, uh, listless, uninterested, but hyper active, even in a sort of torporous state. In other words, your mind is paralyzed by inactivity, but flying everywhere, and your body is doing the same thing. Um, you have no energy to perform any tasks, but you try and do a thousand things and get none of them done. Or maybe you don't try to do anything, but you believe that you should be doing a thousand tasks. It's a interesting and multifaceted um, phenomenon, I think. And I think that putting a putting an actual name on that as opposed to just torpor or depression or sloth or something um, is I think a, a valuable thing when you're looking at the actual um, issues that Schopenhauer raises because boredom and ennui like ennui is a kind of close to acedia but acedia I think is a more precise term it's referring to something more particular um, it's an interesting thing because I think that that might be more what he would be referring to, Schopenhauer, um, the mess, the monster that's waiting for you when you achieve your next goal. It's just you have to get up and do something again because you're sitting on the bus and seeing all those people drinking tea and you're saying that is death, hell, unendurable. It's a mortal sin to do that because the the, the repercussions of, of living like that are so severe that anyone who would do that kind of deserves the horrific um, results of falling prey to acedia. Um Well, I would put the question this way. You'd say I'm talking either to Schopenhauer or my self-effacing Englishman. Who has the problem, them or you? It's um, it's an interesting sort of variation on Voltaire's famous aphorism. I think it was him. I don't know. They, they said, "What's the difference between a European and an Asiatic?" Well, the European has no idea what on earth to do if you're sitting alone in a silent, empty room. <laughs> Presumably, the Asiatic can just you know be okay at you know at that. I some truth in that, but Asia's catching up quickly <laughs> in, in terms of the need for constant distractions. One of the things that I think would uh, would sort of um, make acedia different from depression is the fact that you're not so much, there's nothing to do, but you're waiting for something to come to you. You're waiting for something to come. It's this weird paralysis um, that sort of creeps into you, and you can't get out of it. It's almost as though you need some you're you're in some place and you need somebody to reach in and pull you out of that. It's um it's it you're 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 in a a place you don't want to be and the very fact that you're in there it's also a place that robs you of the strength to get out. That to me is kind of what acedia is and it's interesting that it's looked upon uh by a lot of the monastic writers of, you know, late antiquity or the early medieval period as a truly horrific state, worse than most. In fact, it might be the worst state that's possible to have because it's it's so bad, but it doesn't really look all that bad. Um, I'll read a quote from uh, a page that I'll link to in the, in the links bar. It's a religious page, but again, a lot of the literature has to do uh, that has to do with this has been uh, churned out by religious people. Um, Contrary to other, the other main passions, acedia does not give birth to any particular passion on account of its producing almost all of them. No other demon follows close upon the heels of this one, affirms Evagorius, or Evagrios, who explains elsewhere, the thought of acedia is not followed by any other thought, first because it lingers, and then because it contains within itself almost all thoughts. So it's a whirlwind of disjointed thoughts that paralyze you, that paralyze your mind. Too much thought causing the mind to paralyze. St. Maximus likewise said that acedia excites practically all the passions together. In other words, you have this brainstorm, but in a negative sense. In other words, a whirling tempest of the brain, of the mind, 
uh, completely out of control. Um, in a more general way, uh, St. Barsanufius teaches that the spirit of Asidia engenders every evil. St. John Climacus consequently notes that for the monk, despondency is a general death, and St. Simeon, the new theologian as well, uh, concludes that it is the death of the soul and the mind. He adds, if God were to allow this demon to use all his might against us, undoubtedly no ascetic would be saved. No ascetic, I love the Schopenhauerian tie in there. In the face of the extent of these effects, the fathers also affirm that acedia is the most burdensome and the most overwhelming of the passions. The gravest of the eight principal passions, and that there is no passion worse than it. Here's my favorite bit. St. Isaac said that it causes the soul to taste hell. <laughs> um, for a medieval monastic, that's pretty strong stuff. It causes the soul to taste hell. So in, in, in the opinion of a lot of these guys, uh, acedia is um, the worst thing in the world. It's our room 101. And us postmoderns, I think, are going to be particularly prone to this kind of thing because we now have endless distractions and a lot, of, lot more time on our hands than our ancestors did. Now, Schopenhauer sort of says, uh, as his prescriptive, ascetic contemplation and don't have babies. Now, it's all very well, Schopenhauer, but here's some people who have made a life of doing this, what you prescribe, and look what they meet. And I think that that's where the, um, the paradoxes of what, or the, I don't know, half-heartedness, or what I would call cowardice, perhaps, that's inherent in what Schopenhauer is saying, comes forth most abundantly. What you're saying is we have to immerse ourselves in ascetic contemplation, but look what awaits us when we go into that, into ascetic contemplation. Ascedia. Um, a state that causes the soul to taste hell. Now, one of the screwy things about, you know, a lot of the early 19th century philosophers or all philosophers since then, or all post-Christian philosophers, I guess, is a weird tendency to treat anything religious as haram. In other words, I don't want to have anything to do with this. Perhaps it was Schopenhauer's Protestant Puritanism still sort of uh, asserting itself. Um, all this stuff is Catholic, I don't know, but um, he seems to give very little... He seems to say that boredom and ennui are horrible, but boredom and ennui are the perpetual bane of the ascetic and the contemplative. Um, again, he, it's almost as though he's saying that the only way to come to terms with what he calls ennui, which I would sort of use the word acedia, because it's more precise, I think, than ennui. Um, the, um, the very prescriptive that he does have has pratfalls all of its own. So again, maybe he's on to the right track, but I think he's got to go a lot further. You have to understand the horror that you're facing, and I don't even think Schopenhauer does. I don't even think Schopenhauer grasps. Uh, even as he hammers away at this point of ennui that's always there, always ever-present, I don't think he actually grapples with it and says, here's how we should deal with it. Or, um, or acedia, ennui, boredom, emptiness, whatever, um, is an obstacle that we must attempt to overcome. I think for Schopenhauer, um, acedia is something that causes the soul to taste hell, and I get the funny feeling that it was an obstacle he never overcame. Um, I don't blame him in a way. Um, it's a phenomenon. If you've ever tasted it, I have, <laughs> and I continue to. It literally is about as bad as things can get. Um, it's if you ask me, acedia is uh, is the best friend to existential horror, um, because and I think you can you can suffer the two simultaneously. And I think that that was the big black spot 
that Schopenhauer couldn't bring himself to face. The sum of all evil. Um, and I said, it, uh, you know, he goes no further than life is useless, if you ask me. I know people will argue with this. Um, but I don't think he ever seriously attempts to slay that dragon, uh, the dragon of Acedia. Um, it's, uh, it's a sort of a, as I say, a very nuanced term, but again, the early medieval monastics knew all about it, and they dealt with it thoroughly. Um, one wonders why a comparative modern like Schopenhauer would have not looked in that direction. He seems to say, this is insurmountable, the, the issue of acedia and futility, therefore, life is pointless. For all their mumbo-jumbo rubbish, the monks at least said acedia can be dealt with successfully, and one would assume they had examples of that in their lives. Um, I'm certainly not going to prescribe anything religious, however many people are going to impute a religious impetus behind my fascination with Eastern philosophy and Tantra. I don't see it that way at all, but there you are. Um, I think it can be dealt with. But I think that takes all the resources at our command to do so. And the worst of it is, when you work yourself, or when you, res when you end up in that state where you're forever watching the horizon for the boat to come that will save you from it, and it never comes. So you conclude that Acedia is insurmountable. It is hell itself, and it's inevitable. Because that's one thing that depressives always tell you. You know you're in a horrible spot, and you know you simply don't even have the strength to begin to get out of it. Um, I can see why people would give up in the face of that. Uh, despair mixed in with lethargy, mixed in with futility, mixed in with everything else, mixed in with every conceivable passion all at once, bumping into each other, cancelling each other out, and being reborn again, and, you know, if you've ever laid there in a state of existential depression or despondency, you'll, you'll know what that feeling is. You'll know what they're referring to when they say all thoughts and passions at once, <laughs> mixed with lethargy. Well, there are those who say that it can be dealt with and it can be defeated. The church fathers have all kinds of ways to deal with it. We don't, I wouldn't necessarily go along with any of them, but I don't think you have to sort of say that the only way out is delusion, as Zapfe seems to say. Um, saying that a solution to one's problem is nothing more than a delusion could very well be a delusion itself. 